We want to thank you very much for joining us today for the webinar for the San Diego FAST team, um, being presented by the San Diego FAST team drone probes. And everybody will be still coming in as we're getting started. Glad you could make it. I do want to go over a few details um, as far as what the safety team is all about. Uh, we're trying to do an outreach uh, for just kind of making ourselves available for any of the UAS pilots here in the San Diego and Imperial County area. Uh, <coughs> WINGS is a pilot proficiency program. That's probably how you were notified about this uh, webinar. And uh, you can go ahead and sign up through the faasafety.gov if you haven't already. Uh, we will have several actual drone pros here today. I do want to let you know that we are all, all volunteers. We don't actually work for the FAA, but we just have it on our heart to be able to make ourselves available to help you out if you have any questions. So you can contact us. We'll provide you some of the contact information. At the end, we try to uh, leave some time for Q&A so you could reach out to us. And even after this presentation, if there's anything that you want to know, feel free to reach out to us because if we don't have the answers, we try to look into it for you, okay? And looks like we still have people coming in. And Ron is with us, so I'm going to bump him over. And here are the drone pros that'll be with us today. Uh, my name is Desi Eckstein. Oh, somebody needs to be muted. And that is, go ahead and mute yourselves, okay. Um, so my name is Desi Eckstein. I am the lead fasting representative here in San Diego. Uh, I'm a UAS instructor. I'm an AUVSI level three pilot and I own my own company and it's called On The Go Video Biz. Uh, Ron Barham, he's a drone pro also. Uh, he is here on the line with us as well. Uh, Wyatt Woolsey is here. He's a drone pro. He's going to tell a little bit about himself because he's going to be speaking today. And then Jim Bonnerdale will be here as well. And he will be sharing about himself. Um, and all of us are drone pros. You can reach out to us. Our guest speaker today is amazing. He is Eric Hanscom, and he is a uh, patent and trade, uh, trademark attorney, uh, very well known here in our area. Uh, some of the highlights that I wanted to point out about him, but I know he's going to introduce himself as well. But um, some of the things that I enjoy knowing about him is that he is an ambassador uh, back in 2014 for the pair it bebop and he's got amazing footage that he took with it uh, he's very active in our drone community and um, it's very exciting to see some of the photos and and uh, every time I see his information that he shares I get excited and I can't wait to go out and fly by him so we're very very lucky to have him here with us today so um, here are some of the things that we're going to be covering in this webinar of course FAA safety, right? That's what we're all about. Uh, we have come up with some possible locations for you to fly here in San Diego and the Imperial counties. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about FAA airspace, uh, things that you need to consider for safe flight. We're going to go over some of that as well. And then we want to remind you that you are the RPIC, so you always need to do the homework. So we're going to cover a lot of that. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure you're thinking safety. Safety is the top priority, right? There is a lot of Class D airspace around here, and so we're pretty lucky about that. Uh, you need to make sure you do a little bit more than just check your app. So we actually have a really funny story that we're going to tell you a little bit later on. But you want to do more homework besides just, oh, it's a class G airspace and I'm going to fly. You want to make sure that you plan your flights and you prepare them ahead of time. So we're going to go over a little bit of that as well. And you always, always want to practice the safety side of things. I do have a couple of important reminders that you want to make sure that you don't fly over 400 feet. 
don't fly in wilderness areas. And I'm gonna show you later a little trick that you can see where the wilderness areas are as well as through your apps, because I, I know you'll see a lot of that. Um, key thing is you wanna make sure you're also not flying over people. So some of these areas are going to really have a concern when it comes to flying over people. Uh, you wanna make sure that you are not um, are respectful for, you are respectful for her privacy and nuisance laws. And then you want to make sure that you stay away from emergency responders as well. So when you're getting ready to plan your flight, you want to make sure that you know the rules. Look at this picture. Isn't this beautiful? So we went out and scouted some of the areas and it is, it, you know, San Diego is just a beautiful place to fly. But you need to do a little bit of homework. You need to know the rules. You need to know the FAA rules. You need to know what the rules are for the specific locations that you're flying as well. Some areas I found that you need a permit to fly. Some you wanna make sure, do you have permission to fly? Not just, I'm gonna go here, it's public land, it's class G. Well, it could be owned by somebody and you need to make sure that person has given you permission. You want to start looking also into your local parks and rec. Start looking into going online and checking out, okay, what are their rules? What do they have to say about me flying in this location? Do they have any drone rules that I should be aware of? And then obviously you want to think about the hazards. Okay, so hazards are not just there's going to be telephone lines or utility lines. Uh, this picture right here is actually perfect because if you see in this picture up here, uh, there's a whole swarm of birds. Birds are a definite hazard if you're thinking of flying near the beach. So uh, they tend to be a magnet towards certain drones more than others, but you want to make sure that you're checking out those types of hazards. You want to make sure the trees, the weather, you want to make sure you're not flying over people or the animals. You want to make sure that you're not flying over the animals as well. Again, you want to make sure that you are being very aware of privacy and nuisance. It's not up to the FAA, it is up to you to fly responsible. So some of the sites that I actually looked at were a nice, grassy area would have been great for flying but i was completely surrounded by large homes and one of them i saw as an example was there was a home with a huge beautiful window because they want to see the ocean front so when i would have been taking off with my drone i would have been going straight up i would have been looking at the ocean but the guy in the window sitting there having lunch at his table, he would have not thought that. He would have thought he's the celebrity and that drone is facing him and I'm spying in his window. So you want to be really respectful for other people and their privacy. Uh, when I went out and did my research, I tend to go, I like to say I go to the source. I always go to the FAA. That's the first place that I always look. There are many, many apps out there. We're going to kind of cover those today too. But um, I always go to the facility map first because it's going to tell me, can I fly here and what uh, AGL if I'm going to. So that's always where I go. I tend to migrate right to the FAA websites for all of my information. Uh, Lance will give you notification for some of the locations. It is not the perfect remedy. It is one place you can go look for things, but don't trust any one app. So there's several that are out there. There's AirMap, Altitude Angel, Kitty Hawk, uh, several other ones that are out there. Um, again, later on, we're gonna tell you a kind of a funny story about that, but you wanna make sure that you are being very thorough with the work that you're checking into. Uh, San Diego can be just a huge conglomerate of charts and how to read them. Uh, but the bottom line is you want to make sure that you're aware of the area that you're flying in. You want to check for your TFRs. You want to look and see what airspace you're in. And so San Diego can be quite congested. <laughs> 
Uh, you can go on to the FAA website. You can find out our, about your TFRs. And um, again, double check them just in case something might pop up. And I had told you earlier that I was going to show you, um, I tend to, again, go back to the FAA uh, websites. Here's Sky Vector. Right there is how you can identify a wilderness area. Uh, later on, we're gonna show you how through air maps, it'll show you the wilderness areas as well. But this is uh, one of the ways you can check it as well through Sky Vector. So there's several different ways you can do your homework. Uh, one of the things that I recommend doing is staying connected. So these are just a few things that I do. Um, I want to do a shout out to Droners by Squadrones because they are an FAA or a um, Facebook group that helped me with some of the uh, research that was here. Along with my class at TCI, they went out and scouted stuff out for me. Um, but by staying connected, you meet people, you're having that uh, networking, you'll find places to fly, you'll learn safety, share safety. So I, I really suggest that you stay connected. Uh, I also found out that Kit Carson Park is allowing Steve Eskerlin and his group to go fly there again. And so um, that's something you may want to look into. Uh, FAA Wings will give you some uh, notifications as well. And then sign up for news updates. There's several programs out there. I just happened to pick these two. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but uh, Drone DJ and UAV Coach. There's several others out there. Um, AMA organization is fantastic for recreational pilots. Um, I was going to have Jim Bonnerdale uh, say a few words here, but it looks like he wasn't able to make it. So I just want to share about the AMA. So when you go on to your um, air maps, you will actually see the AMA fields on there. Uh, AMA is about the Academy of Model Aeronautics and they are a fantastic group. They have one that Jim Bonnerdale is very, very um, uh, connected with is the Silent Electric Flyers. Uh, Cholas RC Park, there's Palomar, there's several that are around in our area. And they're a great resource for connecting with other pilots as well. So here we are, where can we fly? So I did some research and this is based on class G airspace. It is not necessarily based on, we have permission from any property owners or doing the deep dive into the uh, parks and rec and such like that. Um, but I did go through, uh, find some of these locations, went out to them. Uh, Oceanside Pier right up there on the top. Sea Cliff is another one that's on there. Uh, Covier, Calumet, and Black Mountain, and Cholis. Cholis actually isn't shown on this. It's further down. Uh, we didn't get the information on that one until a little bit later. Um, but those were all locations that I was uh, pointed in the direction to go fly. So remember how I said it was all class G airspace? Check it out, right here. This is all the area that they are in. And so they really did come up as class G airspace. I even took a look at some of the signage, nothing there that said no drones. So I, I made sure those locations were good. There are a few things that I do want to point out though. Um, Oceanside Pier, when I dug deeper into that one, um, it is obviously a very populated area. Parking was very difficult um, and you need to be very cautious of people. And then also it looked as if you would need to get a permit through Oceanside because um, they might have some rules in, uh, regarding recreational flying there. So dig deeper on that one. Um, it did come up as the Class G airspace. Sea uh, Cliff, I believe this one is also from the upper part of the location, was called Swami. 
Um, but once you go down there into the stairs, there's this beach line in there. Um, again, make sure of you get there early because the parking, you're flying over people. Um, I think I got kind of lucky in, right now because there aren't as much uh, activity out on the beaches right now. And so um, that whole beach line was actually open when I was there. So if you were being a cautious pilot and you get out there early and make sure you're just aware of your surroundings. And so you want to just make sure you're not flying over people. These two parks were down more in La Jolla area, class G, but it is a very congested area. Beautiful area, but both of them, you do have to be very cautious of your surroundings. There was uh, wildlife out there. Um, a lot of people were there in the area. And funny story, I did see a drone flying there at the time. I thought, oh great, he's out, he's over the water, he's being safe. And then all of a sudden the guy turns and flies right over all of us. And I went, okay, we wanna make sure we are not flying over people, all right? So be cautious there. Very, very active place, but beautiful location. Black Mountain is great. It's uh, inland a little bit more, had a lot of open space. Uh, there was some uh, park rules and rec that I did kind of find for open space areas. Um, from the digging that I have done, I didn't find anything that said that that was not an area that could be flown in. And I like the openness that this area had to offer. Uh, Cholas Park was one that was brought up uh, later. And this one, if you notice, it does actually have the Lance approval that is needed. And so it looks like you can ask for approval up to 150 feet. And also um, from the signs that we had seen out there, it didn't say anything about, it didn't allow drones. Again, do some homework on your own and make sure, but it, I didn't, we didn't see any signs that said no drones on that one. So, hope that was helpful of the areas here. It's so exciting because of this whole venture that we are doing. We're going down the coast of San Diego, we're going around down south. <coughs> down lower, bless you. And then you. we're going to be going all the way around and seeing all the uh, Salton Sea and all that. So it, it's a great journey that we're taking you on today. It's pretty exciting. So, okay, with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. I'll give it over to you, Wyatt, and you're up. Up, oh, Jim wants to talk. No, Jim will wait his turn, I promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We'll circle back, okay? Sure. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All righty. My name is Wyatt Wolsey. I am an AUBSI top operator, level three. I'm also an ITC certified SUS thermographer. I am certified in PIX 4D. I hold a daylight waiver. Uh, my area is focused is in critical infrastructure, particularly the oil and the gas field. <clears throat> um, I put this presentation together on the road here. I was out doing some thermal inspections, so I'm going to kind of show you. Um, I'm going to talk about how this is going to relate to you in a work aspect. I want to talk about when you get into flying in some of these areas, um, you know, critical infrastructure that could be around there and maybe places to avoid. As you can see, you know, this is a satellite view of the map that Desi had printed out. You can see one over here flying in this airspace. You got one way out here. Um, there's a lot of Class G airspace out here the air map shows. Um, we're going to talk about just using air maps and why you don't want to do that and why you want to get a lot more information before where you are going to go flying at for obvious reasons. Um, I'm kind of going to focus in this area down here in Southern California down by Chula Vista. There's not a lot of area down here per se to fly because of wilderness areas. A lot of wilderness area over here that does not show on air maps as well. So we're gonna talk about some areas that you can fly um, that I've been to, I've talked to game and fish, I've talked to park rangers, and I've kind of got the okay. 
as long as everything is met. And that's going to be one of the main things you want to do. You know, you don't want to go fly all willy nilly on some of this stuff. You know, everything you do with this, whether it's going to be for hobby or if you're going to get into business doing these, you need to have a proper flight plan laid out for you. And the more you get used to doing that, the better it's going to serve you as you go down the road. So right here, this is down in Coronado Caves. It's north of IB. You cannot fly a drone in IB. Um, the city itself has stipulations against it. That's the last time I had heard anyway. Um, and there's a military airspace up there. Both of these airspaces are zero ground <coughs> AGL or zero feet AGL. Right here is the Silver Strand State Beach camping area. So you definitely don't want to fly around in there. And this is going to be the K's Yacht Club over here. So you got to think about this if you're going to go fly down there, right? So you can fly. Just be aware of what you're getting into. You know, there's going to be privacy concerns down there. There's going to be housing that's close. Your state beach is close. Um, just do what you're supposed to do, right? Have some integrity when you get down into fly these areas. Um, you can fly there. Just don't mess it up by flying over here or over here or over here or over here. Because if something goes down, we already have enough problem with people doing things that they're not supposed to be doing with drones, right? So let's not add to the problem, we're gonna be part of the solution. Uh, Sweetwater Reservoir, this is off the 54 and the 125. I can also fly here. I've talked to some folks here. Um, where I would recommend it probably be up in these areas here. However, we can fly all around this area. I would stay out of down in this area though. Um, there's some little towns down in here. I believe it's Fowler. Um, this is one of the places I want to talk to if you're going to go out and fly where I'm going to preach my critical infrastructure because that's what I do for a living, right? So if you're going to come out here and you're going to fly around, this is a water treatment facility here and there's a dam here. I know everybody wants to get pictures of all this stuff because it's really cool. There's a way to go about doing that and there's a way to not go about doing that. So if you want to get pictures of the dam, I would definitely talk to the folks at the water treatment facility plant, you know, maybe get some other people's information around there so they can do that. I just wouldn't go and fly around a dam as I wouldn't go and fly around Oceanside Pier and I wouldn't go fly around any big windmills or anything like that. And I wouldn't go fly around any oil rigs because all that stuff's part of critical infrastructure. And if you're out there flying and somebody out there is trying to do a job and you don't see them, that could create issues. Now you don't have, only one aircraft in the air, you're gonna have two in the air. So you can fly in a lot of places, right? Just put forth the work to find out what you have to do to fly there. These areas that I'm talking about, you can fly. I have talked to these guys. There's just things to be aware of, correct? So again, Fiesta Island, I've been out here to fly. This right down here is Silent Electric Flyers. Jim knows all kinds of good stuff about them, so I'll let him talk about that. But I wanna point another thing out here. So if you're gonna come out here and fly, you can fly around in here. This here is a Vortex station. So if you're wanting to catch pictures and you come out here to start flying, you know, you probably wanna come out here and swing around this and catch some pictures of it. Just be aware, you aren't authorized to fly on this side of the Vortex station. So unless you get authorization to fly over here, just don't fly over here. It might only be a 30 second quick, quick swoop around that to get four or five pictures. Just remember, you're in an area that you're not supposed to be flying in without authorization. So keep that in mind when you go to plan your flights and the things that are gonna be in that area. Um, <clears throat> this is gonna be where I'm gonna start getting into relying solely on applications to find out where you wanna fly. This here is a Google view of this. San Vicente Reservoir. This is up by Lakeside. You can fly here. You, you got to fly what I was told was off of these paths, roads over here and keep it in this area. The reason being is this is a marina and it's a fairly large boat ramp and there's a lot of people that can come down in here. You know, wherever you go, no matter if it's a hundred people or one person, you can't fly over top of that person. So keep that in mind. Um, why you don't want to just rely on apps for this is because if you looked at air maps, these screenshots were taken off my phone the other day at the same time at 1210. Um, and all I did was zoom in one more click. 
So if you think you're going to show up and you're going to fly in this area as a launch pad because it looks nice and flat, when that happens, you're actually going to be out here in the middle of the water. So as you start planning your missions, and if this is going to get into uh, where you're wanting to use this as a career and, and start doing inspections and stuff, this can mess with you if you don't do your work and find out where you're going. So as an instance, this was a thermal roof inspection that I had just completed in Fallon, Nevada. Um, these were the pictures that the client had sent me off of air maps. So I go through there and I mark them all up and show the flight patterns and that. But this was no longer there. So I ran into this issue a lot with AC units not being there, AC units being there um, <clears throat> that aren't shown on air maps. So always do your dil due diligence on the area that you're going to fly. Um, you know, like me, I require a pre-operation walk on every job before an aircraft has ever thought of being taken out into the field. Because as you can see here, through the 70 some pictures, there's nothing there. So now if you forget how many pictures or you're on the phone with a client and they're like, well, how many units were on the roof? And you don't remember. And you get on your air maps and you tell them five, but there were seven or you tell them six, but there's four. Now you're going to start harming your credibility. Just over the fact that you can't remember. So always do some work, you know, don't ever rely on these, these apps solely for launch areas. Um, you can kind of get yourself into a jam on that. And, and I, I can't stress enough, you know, some of us work out here in critical infrastructure. So please, please try to keep your aircraft away from critical infrastructure stuff. I know it's gonna be cool. I know that there's reasons behind it and you wanna get pictures of it. But like I said, there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And if you're getting out there to do it and you're not paying attention and you didn't do it the right way and somebody out there is actually inspecting what you're, what you're looking at or trying to take pictures of, you're, you're going to cause harm in their operations. You're going to get in the way of their operations. You might not have the authority to be there even though you see a drone in the air. They might have the authority to be there. You might not. So, you know, that there's always a lot of things to think about. This is a constantly evolving field. So... You, you know, we, we've, we've got to do our jobs and evolve with it, correct? I believe that's all I have for slides, so I'm going to stop there. I wish I had more, but I put that together on the road, so I appreciate it. <laughs> all right, we will segue into Eric, or shall we circle back to... Circle back to Jim. You're being muted there, Eric, but go ahead, Jim. You are up. Can you share a little bit about where we can fly and maybe a little bit about the AMA? Yeah, you bet. Well, you know, I'm glad we got, got I was able to jump in. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as, as mentioned, I pretty much have my fingers in most of the clubs down here. And I see a lot of our participants here that are doing a um, good job in the area. But I want to uh, let you know a couple things that, you know, the Silent Electric Flyers of San Diego, um, we were the very first uh multi-use air park uh, granted within 2.5 miles of a major airport and, and the first uh, permanent fixed rotorplex, a place to go with your multi-rotors and your drones and a great uh, practice field to, uh, to hone your skills and things like that. So as Wyatt mentioned, that circle there, that circle there kind of is shown because it's given us approval. And uh, what that really means is that means that once we go on to site, once we're on the facility and we're meeting the rules of the facility, meaning we're at AMA and we're also a club member, we're already approved to fly in that zone recreationally. So we don't need to go online and get airspace. We're in that, we're in our bubble. Now, uh, granted the bubbles that are drawn on the map, nice perfect radiuses. No, our, our property line is not a perfect radius. So it's really the best indication of where you can be. And it's for pilots of manned aircraft to know there are going to be unmanned operations in the area. So now when we go down to Choyas Park, uh, Choyas is behind a fixed gate. So they are a little, it's a little bit different there. It's a very uh, popular park. Uh, they're more popular with helicopters. Uh, helicopters have kind of become one of the biggest uh, users of that park. Uh, because of the close-in confined areas, 
uh, they don't get spectators. And you guys may be aware of that 3D helicopter operations are pretty dangerous. Um, so yeah, at Silent Electric Flyers, we could have a bicyclist or a pedestrian stroll through occasionally by accident. And we, you know, they can't have that there. So helicopters have gone there and they have the same thing. Once you're in the air park or once you're in the facility, you don't have to ask for authorization. Um, Desi, you hadn't mentioned, I don't, I don't think I heard you say anything about the uh, park down at Borderfield State Park, the Chula Vista Radio Control Club. Uh, Chula Vista Radio Control Club is a all aspects club uh rotorcraft electric gas large scale they've got a nice large runway um the only thing that they have is uh they're about 20 feet from the international border and they fly with the border fence at their back so you cannot go behind you uh down at chula vista you got to fly all the way out in front of you um and while you're down there you can probably expect to have to yield the right of way to border patrol aircraft and border patrol officers on uh, quads and ATVs. But it's still a great facility. They have a nice place to fly down there. They're still also AMA. Um, and of course you did mention Palomar and we have weed whackers also. But for sure, for drone pilots, one of the things I'll mention, the reason why I, I am I'm speaking so highly of uh, SEFSD is that there are practice, uh, there's drone practice hoops and gates and there's targets out in the field for you to take your drone out and take pictures of. Yes, those targets are boring targets, but they still meet the need for uh, training and fixtures and things like that. And if you want to come out and learn mapping missions and things like that, we have 48 acres there that's all for us and nobody else goes there. So it's really a, a great facility for something like that. Yep. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to make any slides. No, you didn't, but thank you. Thank you. Sure. And the slide that I made for you had already gone by. So <laughs> thank you. Excellent information. Thank you. So, all right, let's move on to Eric. Are you good to go, Eric? You want to share your screen? I am. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Thumbs up. Yes. Okay, very good. All right. Well, as Desi said, my name's Eric Hanscom. I'm a patent and trademark attorney here in Carlsbad, California. I'm a part 107 pilot as well, and I've made exactly uh, no money at it, but I just fly for fun. So anyway, um, one thing that you probably picked up on from the previous speakers is got to be worried about infrastructure, buildings, people, animals, all this kind of stuff. Well, I'm going to take you on a tour of eastern San Diego County and Imperial County, where you're going to get to areas that are pretty much wide open. Now, I know when I first got a drone, which was a Phantom 2 Vision, I had very little idea what I was doing, but I knew enough to take it out in the middle of the uh, Brago Springs Desert, not Anza Brago State Park, but Brago Springs Desert, and fly it where I knew I wasn't going to be crashing into anything. These uh, Ocotillo plants tend to sue a lot less than uh, the government organizations whose city halls you might hit. So anyway, uh, let me take you on a quick tour here. Uh, we're kind of going to get, drive out the 8 and see some of the places that you can fly along the 8. Then we're going to go into the Brago Springs and the Salton Sea area. Um, you could easily do this as a weekend if you wanted. Uh, hitting all these spots in one day would be a little bit challenging. <clears throat> so the first place I want to stop is the Sunrise Highway. This is the highway that connects Julian with Highway 8. And uh, there are a number of little pull-offs that you can pull off here and fly your drone. Legal flying, except for a section that goes through Anza Borrego State Park. And this is not my favorite place to fly because uh, you're, you're basically overlooking a canyon to the east, which means that in the morning, the sun's right in your eyes. And in the afternoon, probably there's been a, a heavy wind or something like that that's kicked up some dust. Often visibility is kind of lousy, but um, the lagunas are much more open, and at least in this area to flying than say Palomar Mountain with Palomar Mountain State Park and the observatory there. So if you really want to get up and fly in the pine trees and see some meadows and things like that, Sunrise Highway is a good place to go. <clears throat> now let's continue <clears throat> down the eight toward the desert. Uh, the next place that, that I've flown is Kitchen Creek Road. Uh, Kitchen Creek Road is an exit here. You get off the eight and turn back underneath the freeway and you start heading up. Anybody notice anything uh, about this uh, slide here they'd like to comment on? 
stepped away. I when I look at it. I know, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when you're looking here, uh, like Eric was saying, you know, if you're gonna fly here, see these fire stations. And if you look off to your east there, you're gonna see this Campo Border Patrol station. So just if it was me and I was going to fly there, I would probably show up there and talk to these guys be like, Hey, you know, I'm going to put a drone up in the air and just kind of do your due diligence with these guys. Because the last thing you want to do is make the fire department mad. Right. And the last thing you want to do is make the border patrol mad by putting a drone up in the air. I don't think honestly, as much as I've talked to any of these guys with the fire departments or border patrol areas, because I live down in this area with them, um, that they're going to shoot you down. I really don't think that. I just think that it would be nice, and I think they would appreciate it if you let them know what was going on. Um, you know, if somebody starts giving you kind of an attitude about flying there, you might have the right to fly there, but you might want to think about it maybe when you're down the road. Um, we're all in this to make a better vision for our, our, our field and not – taking pictures of blue angels from so close and dive bombing commercial airliners and all that kind of stuff. Right. So it all starts somewhere. So just by bettering ourselves, I mean, that, that's a good place to start. I would say. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Okay. So this is kitchen Creek road right here heading up. You notice that uh, it's legal flying, but it's why it said you go right past uh, two fire stations and there's the border patrol checkpoint here and they got a headquarters there. So pretty easy to call ahead of time or swing by. Now, Kitchen Creek Road, again, not the most spectacular flying, but it's fun. It's a great place to take the family. If you go up Kitchen Creek Road about, about 13 miles right now, there's a gate. Fortunately, um, the good flying is right before the gate, and you run into this lovely little seasonal creek. Take the family down there, see some wildlife, and fly your drone around. This uh, Might as well enjoy it for the next month because it'll be gone by the end of summer. Okay, heading further down, we get to the abandoned railroad cars near Acumba. Um, to get here, you take the eight past the abandoned railroad cars, and you get off. There's a, a Shell station and a Chevron station here. Uh, make a quick right turn, go back underneath the freeway, and then you look for parking. Um, by parking, this is really a, a, a kind of a questionable term because the parking here are areas that people have basically carved out into the hillside. This can comfortably, the parking area can comfortably hold maybe eight cars, uh, depending on you know how good of a four-wheel drive you have and how vertical you mind the parking. Um, if you're going to uh, try to fly the railroad cars here, my advice is get there either early or late because seven miles up this railroad track is the goat trestle, which is a full day hike and the people who do the goat trestle, they show up at seven in the morning and they don't come back until 3.30 or four in the afternoon. So uh, if you show up at 10, uh, probably all the parking will be taken. Also- can I, can I add something? Sure. Eric, oh gosh, I gotta tell you, uh, uh, I have flown there commercially at yes. those trail tracks. So, so my piece of advice there, my piece of advice is to drive right into the nudist colony drive right into the office, walk up to the office gate where the little sign-in sheet is and say, you're there because you'd like to take pictures of the train and put a $20 bill down. And they'll say, thank you so much. They'll give you a map and you can drive now and be within 50 steps okay, of I'm that sold. train track. I'm sold. I, I, you know, I, I drove up to the gate once. I turned around, but I've got, a, I've got a sixth grader. Every time we drive by there, he looks up, he goes, this is a place where they're nudes. Yeah, so this is yeah. what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I have a, I'm, I'm put on his hat backwards or something like that. Jim, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I pay 20 bucks to park, park make, closer. Make a friend, make a yeah. friend. And then, you know what? Anytime you, anytime you go back, they'll just, oh yeah, go right ahead. No okay. problem. So, yep. so you've just solved the biggest problem here. So anyway, uh, this is, as Jim mentioned, a nudist colony. They're probably not too keen on people parking here, flying their drones overhead to get shots of the railroad track. But I like Jim's solution better than any I've heard so far. Oh, anyway, uh, this the railroad track makes a really nice little path in between Anza Borrego State Park and the wilderness. So it's legal flying, but you know you don't wanna be hiking off half a mile in either direction. You certainly don't wanna be hiking half a mile off in this direction because you'll end up in the middle of the nudist colony. Um, 
These are what the abandoned railroad cars looked like a couple of years ago. It's kind of fun. They're open. You can take your family through. It's like, uh, once you get inside these things, it's like right out of the 1950s. And at this point, some local delinquents had cut the brake cables and pushed the, tra the trains across the track. The, um, <clears throat> the railroad company has since pushed them, pushed them back and locked them in place. But um, it's a fun place. There's this little trestle, and uh, we really enjoy going there. Now, further on down the eight, uh, we come to a trifecta here. You've got the Valley of the Moon, you've got Desert View Tower, and you have Coyote's UFO Retrieval and Repair Service. And um, <clears throat> Valley of the Moon is basically a four-wheel drive trail. Uh, it goes up here in the mountains, beautiful place, but a lot of it is wilderness now. So I'm just gonna show you pictures from the non-wilderness section. Uh, Desert View Tower was built in the 1920s to commemorate the road that finally linked San Diego and Yuma and Coyote's UFO Retrieval and Repair Service. Well, all that kind of speaks for itself. Anyway, here's the wilderness area here. Um, here is the legal um, Valley of the Moon part of the road. Now, last time I was out here, which was a couple weeks ago, uh, Desert View Tower was closed because of COVID. Coyote, on the other hand, was sitting out here in a beach chair welcoming anybody who wanted to come over and talk to him. Um, the, with the lock gate, there's a parking area right here. You can still fly line of sight up by Desert View Tower and then over by Coyotes. So this parking area right in front of the lock gate, kind of a nice place to pull over. Uh, this is Desert View Tower. The owner of Desert View Tower is a gentleman named Ben, real nice guy. Uh, he has no problem with people flying drones, but he does want you to pay the uh, entry fee to walk up here. And if you want to walk in his boulder field, he wants you to pay another entry fee there. But hey, you know what? Give Ben the nine bucks he wants. Buy some coffee from him. Talk to him. He's a really good guy. And uh, he's totally okay with people flying there. Now, uh, this is Coyote's UFO Retrieval and Repair Service. Um, this is, uh, I, I don't really know quite how to describe this place. But anyway, um, Coyote over the last, let's just say Coyote, I think he really enjoyed the 60s. I think that was his favorite decade. Anyway, Coyote has uh, built this art collection from things he found on the freeway, and he's turned it into a UFO retrieval and repair service. If you go by there, he'll talk to you about how he rescues UFOs, helps out the aliens, fixes them up, sends them on their way. And you can't really tell if he honestly believes this or not, but he's, he's a complete trip, really worth talking to. Um, and Coyote began by just taking over this place. He has since moved, taken over this little area, this little area, and he's taken over one of the under ramps as well. So Coyote's a interesting fellow. Um, one thing you should know about Coyote and Ben, Ben does not like Coyote, uh, probably because Ben paid six figures for this place. Coyote paid nothing for this place. And anyway, so if you want to fly with Ben, probably not a good idea to go in there and say, Something like, you know, hey, if Coyote let me fly for free over his place, what are you charging me money for? That'll probably get you the, the no drone sticker pretty quickly. But anyway, they're both real nice guys in their own way. This is the road up to Valley of the Moon. The wilderness section kicks in about here. This is kind of a hairy road. Um, I've got a, a Toyota Sequoia 4Runner. Um, I've done it before. I probably would have rather had a Jeep to do it. Um, this is the actual trail that you have to go up. Um, this area right here gets real interesting. So if you've got two wheel drive, I wouldn't bother trying it four wheel, pretty fun. But again, it's wilderness area. Now a little bit beyond uh, Coyotes and Desert View Tower, there is the area between the two sections of the eight. And so you've got um, basically in red here, this is a two wheel drive. You're basically going on the old free, the old highway eight. So it's very, very easy. Uh, the green is a much rougher road. It's four wheel drive. Um, this is fairly easy four wheel drive, two wheel drive. There's a pretty nasty drop off here. If you get past the drop off, the rest of it's cake. But anyway, it's all fine. You just can't, you shouldn't be flying over the freeway anyway. But um, if you stay in here, you're fine. Uh, if you go in March or April, you can get some killer wildflowers. Um, some beautiful rocks. 
And this is, j just don't drive at night. This is old Highway 8, and it just kind of ends right here. And so you don't want to go driving on the 8 saying, well, I want to see how far the 8 goes because it, it kind of goes into a cliff. But along this area, there's nobody, um, plenty of flying, lots of fun. And again, if you can go March or April, you won't regret it. This is where the easy four-wheel drive turns into the rough four-wheel drive. So obviously, we don't see a whole lot of Priuses and Porsches making it up this road. Okay, continuing on the eight, we've got the old plank road, some sand dunes, and the official center of the world. The old plank road, and again, uh, except for <laughs> what Wyatt and Desi and I pulled up a couple of days ago, uh, looks like it's perfectly okay to fly here. Um, old plank road was a plank road that was built in the 1920s across the sand dunes because you couldn't get across the sand dunes in a Model T. So they built this old plank road, which is basically huge railroad ties that were attached with these, these um, um, metal fasteners. And anyway, this lasted about 10 years until they finally decided to put the old Highway 80, which turned into the Highway 8 that we drive on now. But anyway, there are sections of the old plank road that are still in existence. And these are legal flying and um, kind of a nice area. You can see, you can imagine what it was like to drive a car without suspension from San Diego to Yuma on this thing. So can you share really quick, like the, what happened when we were searching this the other day? Sure. Yeah. Well, actually was I was, so I, was in, <laughs> I was in the middle of the desert coming back from Borrego Springs and I, uh, just happened to um, find an area that was outside of Anza Brago State Park. I was going to do some flying, pulled up air map, it said fine, good to go. Uh, pulled up before you fly, and there was red there. And I thought, oh, come on, I'm not in Anza Brago State Park. What are you talking about? And so I started, you know, scrolling out. Wait, wait a minute, it's still red. Kept scrolling out, it's still red. Hey, all of a sudden, California is red. And it said it was a national security uh, notum for the next four or five days. And so I said, okay, well, you know, I, I, I just gave up, came back, and Desi and White and I were doing a, a kind of a run through on this, and I showed it to them, and we were going, oh, man, this is really interesting. Desi, do you have the screenshots from that by chance? or I, I don't have any screenshots. Okay. We had okay. That. Yeah. So but with that uh, bill there, I looked at it later on that night, and it said it was good to go, but the area was still all red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I don't know if any of you were on before you fly a couple of days ago, but it was it was red from San Clemente Island to I, I I think the second time we looked at it, it was like up in up in Las Vegas, past Las Vegas or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was a glitch in the program because when we fine tuned it, we actually looked through the FAA website and it was just right there specifically along the border, <laughs> and yet. Your before you fly app went all the way to Las Vegas. <laughs> it did. It did. So I think that it's it's kind of like, um, you know, sometimes when we're, when we're doing a, a patentability search for a client, sometimes it comes back just we call it a green light where it looks oh everything looks fine. I think you can probably get a patent on this. Other times there's so many other patents that are close to it. We say you know we don't think you have got a good chance. And somewhere in the middle it's yellow where you really don't know. Well, this is a good example of how you know you can look at all the sources. And sometimes you still don't know what to do. So, you know, just uh, I guess the more sources you look at, the better chance you have of making the correct decision. Okay, so Old Plank Road. And now if, if you want to fly sand dunes, there's some places you can fly near Glamis. Um, I love this little area. Right down this road is a, probably the ranger station with the nicest name I've ever heard. It's called the Buttercup Ranger Station. And you can go in there and talk to the nice rangers about flying at uh, um, the sand dunes here, or flying down at the old plank road. Anyway, nice place to park, nice sand dunes, nobody there most of the time. And, um, but I love flying over and looking at the tracks and realizing some of these tracks, probably a few days old and wondering how many vehicles have been across here. Okay, further down the eight, we get to the official center of the world. This is a place that was formed by a man named Jacques Andre Estelle, who made a fortune as an investment banker. They turned that fortune into the first parachute schools, and then he sold those and he built the official center of the world, um, which consists of uh, a museum, 
a church on the hill and then the maze of honor. This is the church right here. This is the maze of honor where you can pay for a granite uh, plaque to be uh, created from a photograph you give him and he'll put you on here. Um, I have been told by Jacques that I'm the official photographer for the official center of the world. Um, and, and, but I could probably bring a group from San Diego and talk to him ahead of time to get people in. One of my favorite things to do that you see is railroad track out here. There are all sorts of uh, huge freight trains that start off here and end up in Gila Bend. Okay, let's go to the uh, Salton Sea area now. Now, um, the Salton Sea, I think, has a pretty bad reputation as a lot of people think, oh, God, the Salton Sea, it smells there, dead fish. But I've been flying there for about six years now. I just love it. So anyway, um, in the southeastern corner, you've got Obsidian Butte. You've got the mud volcanoes that now are, I think, off limits officially. They keep putting cement barriers in the road. You've got the abandoned spa, and then you've got Salvation Mountain and Slab City. Now, if you look at before you fly, it looks completely clear, but there is an area here that's owned by the Sunny Bono National Wildlife Refuge, and they have banned drones, although they allow duck hunting. So anyway, uh, you want to check the map first to make sure you're not flying in Sunny Bono territory. This is Obsidian Butte, which is the name implies is uh, a little volcanic headland made up of obsidian. Uh, this is all obsidian right here, legal to collect, so it's a great place to take the kids. The obsidian is sharp though, be careful. And this is the Salton Sea, and it does smell. Once every couple months, it'll smell bad. Other than that, it smells great. This is the abandoned spa. Again, in the, the 1940s and 50s, even through the end of the 60s, the Salton Sea was a, a really, really popular area. Matter of fact, the Salton Sea had more visitors than Yosemite National Park did in the 1960s. So it was a really great area. And then uh, everything just started falling apart. The salinity of the Salton Sea went up too much. Uh, there were a couple of floods that wiped out the local communities. Um, there were a couple of real estate scammers who sold a bunch of overpriced lots to people who shouldn't have been buying. And basically the whole area fell apart but there's still areas like this. I love flying around old things. And um, so I, I shoot this area quite often. Um, one thing I also do with my drone is to record the rescission of the level of the Salton Sea because as the Salton Sea goes down, it exposes more of what we call the playa and that causes toxic dust clouds. So anyway, I use my drone to keep track of that. Okay, now Slab City and Salvation Mountain. A um, whole lot to fly around here. Again, wide open area. Can't get too close here, but Salvation Mountain's right here. Slab City right there. This is Salvation Mountain. Salvation Mountain was built over the course of 28 years by a man named Leonard Knight and his disciples. Um, Leonard was a very eccentric man. Um, had a balloon that said, God is love. Crashed the balloon a lot. Had couldn't rebuild the balloon. So he said, God told him to get a bunch of paint, paint the side of a mud hill. So that's what he did. Uh, Leonard's passed on, but he has a number of followers who continue to paint the mud hills. So Salvation Mountain from the air. And you see a little bit like Coyote, you know, he just kind of collected things. So we got boats, we got cars in the 1940s, just a bunch of neat stuff out there. Now the military uh, in 1942 moved out to the Slab, what's now called Slab City, they built a training depot. Um, the training depot closed down in the 50s and they took everything they could take with them, which meant metal and uh, sides of buildings and things like that. They left everything cement. So you've got these water tanks and um, the water tanks have been taken over by local artists who have um, expressed themselves with things like the upside down van and all sorts of uh, murals. Um, these are called the smaller water tanks. This is the obstacle course. Yes, I have. Um, and one of the neatest things is get a parrot disco, get that thing up about 100 feet, dive bomb this. It's a good test of, you know, whether you really trust your flying or not. Um, this is the burnt out car art. It's, it's art. If you don't think it's art, just trust me, it's art. Um, 
this is Slab City. Slab City is a community that was built on the slabs that were left by the Marine Corps. And Slab City is called the last free place on earth. It's a place where snowbirds and people who are down and out basically drive their cars and um, spend time there because the rent's free. Now, uh, Slab City has grown quite a bit over the last 10 years from just you know a few little trailers and motorhomes here to quite a large community. They even have suburbs now. And this is one of the suburbs. Um, this is called East Jesus. The rich people, this is kind of a high rent district. The rich people in Slab City live in East Jesus. And it has, I guess, the best art. So you see here's part of a plane, a boat. These, I don't know, have no idea what those are. Um, but anyway, um, it's, it's the high rent district, kind of the, the Beverly Hills of Salvation Mountain. We've got another boat with a tree planted in it, part of a plane. It's, uh, yeah, it's very creative. People are friendly, though. You can drive through, fly your drone. Nobody gets too upset about anything. Okay, further on up the, uh, the, the highway here in the Salton Sea, you get to Bombay Beach. Now, Bombay Beach is another place that was kind of hit hard by the, um, the, typh the, uh, uh, the, t the tail end of a typhoon and got flooded pretty badly, but it's getting revitalized as an artist colony too. You've got a bunch of art. Uh, again, Bombay Beach, perfectly fair to fly there. Um, you've got boat art, hanging ball art, and then they're building a lot of stuff along the seashore. And what I really like, they really help me out here by putting stuff in the water. That way I can fly here about once every six months and I can see how far the salt sea is coming down. Further on north, you've got the North Shore Yacht Club. Again, legal flying. Uh, North Shore Yacht Club in the 1960s was part of the Salton Sea boom. The Beach Boys played here. The Rat Pack used to come down, race motorboats here. Um, it was standing room only to get in. Uh, when the Salton Sea died, so did uh, the, the North Shore Yacht Club. But it's been revitalized. And fortunately, there's uh, I'm actually on the board of directors of a group called Ecomedia Compass. We're working to try to get the Salton Sea restored. So there is hope for the future here but it's a wonderful place to fly. Now, if you happen to be going up around the north end of the Salton Sea, there's a place called Box Canyon Road. Box Canyon Road goes right in between the wilderness area here, so you can't fly laterally too much, but it's a nice road. Uh, do not fly here or do not drive here when there's a pending rainstorm. Um, flash floods come through here and there's no place to go. Someone was killed here a couple years ago got trapped in their car and it was it was all over quickly. But um, it's kind of, it's a nice place, I enjoy it. And if you drive up to the top of Box Canyon Road, it deposits you on the 10 right near uh, the George S. Patton Museum. So if you have any kids or any um, World War II war buffs, you know, among your, your party, they'd be happy with that too. Continuing around, we get to Travertine Rock and Desert Shores. Um, Desert Shores is the first of three communities on the west side of the Salton Sea. Again, no problems flying there. Uh, this is Travertine Rock. It's a fun place. I've, I always enjoy flying here. And it's, it's a kind of interesting religious place. They have Sunday services here. You've got, you've got a little Jesus in a uh, kind of a, a green cage. And um, this is obviously the, the high point of the services. Now, the Salton Sea is a beautiful area. This shows you the area that has been exposed just over the last six years, and these rivers wind their way through it. Um, Salton Sea is, in, in my mind, still beautiful and worth saving, but uh, obviously we need to pump some water in here if the water levels are going to be restored. This is Desert Shores. This is one of the more affluent communities in the Salton Sea. This used to be um, half million dollar homes with docks that people could launch boats from. Um, they're not worth half a million bucks anymore, unfortunately. Now, as, as the keys here have become silted in and the water levels drop, cyanobacteria have taken these over and turned them different colors, depending on the stage of life that the water is in. And as with the uh, east side of the Salton Sea, there are plenty of old buildings that you can fly around and explore. 
Uh, not much of a danger of flying over people here. This is an old tire shop. And this is what the inside looks like. So anyway, it's an interesting cultural thing to do. Now, my favorite part of the, the uh, Salton Sea are the tilapia beds. You can find these off Seaport Avenue in Salton City. Uh, this used to be connected to the ocean, but as the, or the sea, but as the water level dropped, the uh, uh, the, uh, the the hooks here, the marina, kept getting lower and lower until it was no longer connected to the sea. And as a result, as the water dropped, it became um, more and more saline, and the cyanobacteria moved in. Again, that's right about there. No, right about there. So as they've moved in, it's turned the water just these amazing colors. And the holes here were formed by tilapia fish. When the Salton Sea was first becoming saline in the 1940s, government sent a party down to the Sea of Cortez and said, okay, catch breeding populations of everything you can find. We're just going to bring them up here, dump them in the Salton Sea and see what lives. So Anyway, the croaker and the, the pargo, uh, they all did great. But uh, ironically enough, the, the fish that's outlasted them all is a freshwater fish from Africa called the tilapia. And they have adapted to ever-increasing salt water. Well, the way that they breed is that they dig out these nests. They raise their babies in the nests. And as the water recedes, it exposes the nests. You can see some of the nests that are exposed here. And these turn just some fantastic colors. Uh, and we really haven't been able to figure out exactly why these are both yellow and the one right next to it is orange, other than the size. And I kept writing UCR telling them, you know, if you've got any biochemistry students that are looking for a, a heck of a PhD program, send them down here. But I don't think anyone ever showed up. Anyway, the tilapia beds. Okay, Borrego Springs. Um, Borrego Springs is basically famous for two things. There are the sculptures and the wildflowers. And if you go in, if you have a, a good wet winter, you can go in March and April and you can get both at the same time. So we've got the north end and the south end. North end, the rattle dragon here is uh, probably the most famous sculpture. Again, Borrego Springs is right here with Anza Borrego State Park and Ocotillo Wells on all sides. So there's no drones around, but drones inside are okay. Here's the rattle dragon. Um, these sculptures were commissioned by the late Dennis Avery, who is heir to the Avery label fortune. And he had, I guess, millions and millions of bucks. So he bought up a bunch of square miles in Anza Borrego. He commissioned a sculptor named Ricardo Bersetta to create over a hundred sculptures. And uh, Mr. Avery passed away a few years ago but you know, left an endowment fund to keep these up. And so anyway, I very much appreciate what he did here. This is Scorpion and Cricket. Another shot of the Rattle Dragon. We call it the Rattle Dragon because it has a, rat, a dragon head, rattlesnake tail. And you see the workmanship that went into this. It's just, they're just beautiful. These are Gompophores. Uh, Gompophores were a, a kind of a predecessor to the elephant. And uh, they lived in Borrego, I guess, about 40 million years ago or so. Um, heading to the south, we get into the T-Rexes and the carnivores. Uh, these are the roads that you take to get there. Again, easy, easy four-wheel drive, yeah, pretty decent for two-wheel drive as well. And um, you've got a bunch of carnivores here. Now, what a lot of people don't know about Anza Borrego State Park is you're legally allowed to camp for free anywhere where you're not blocking a road or trampling cactus. And um, my wife and I have a vacation home out here that we rent out. And in the middle of wildflower season, um, last year it was rented out for about four months in a row. So we couldn't visit our own home, but we camped. And our favorite camp spot is right in between the, um, the two carnivores. You can get an idea of the scale. This is a prehistoric bird. There's my Toyota Sequoia. So. They're pretty good size. Um, art it also plays a role in Borrego Springs. Uh, uh, about two months ago, there was an art project out there and they wrapped a number of the sculptures in magenta cloth. So that was kind of neat. 
Okay, driving back to Carlsbad, uh, you go up the S22, it's called the Montezuma Grade Road, and it'll take you through the little town of Ranchita. Um, Ranchita has a very nice, uh, easy four-wheel drive, probably okay two-wheel drive road that goes right outside the Anza Borrego State Park boundaries, so it's legal flying. There is nobody here. So if you know any beginner drone pilots that say, I want to go fly someplace, I want to make sure I don't crash into anybody, well, pull off right there, right there, and I think you're good. Eric? You see the, yes. Can I interrupt one second? Sure. Okay, so for one, we're, we're up, coming up on our one hour, but um, somebody did have a question and we're at a perfect place that it would be good to ask this. Um, uh, they were wondering if there's any signal issues out there. Great question. Very good question. Uh, there were, indeed, about four years ago, I had a, a, a very stressful flyaway, had to chase my Phantom 2 Vision, uh, walked about two miles to find it, but right now there's no problem, plenty of satellites. So I haven't had a signal problem for a couple of years. Um, and it, as far as picking up air mapper before you fly, yes, you will have a problem with that on some of the back roads, oh. but it really depends on who your server is. I found T-Mobile seems to be the worst out on some of the four wheel drive roads. Um, Verizon seems to be okay, but you know, if, if you have a bunch of people with different phones, you can probably put it together decently. And can I jump in real quick with something? Sure. Sure. Well, something to definitely be a very cognizant of and making sure you're really paying attention to when out in the middle of the desert, especially in a high heat environment and in a vast openness, meaning you don't have a lot of cell phone towers to work from. You always want to pay attention to your KP index. Uh, weather, weather forecasts will tell you what the KP index and for the Layman, really what that means is that means it's the ability of the satellite signal to get through or how much satellite signal we're going to get based on solar radiation. So especially out in the desert, make sure you really be very careful anytime you're flying and your K KP index is at a four or above. Good point. Excellent. So just one more place here on the way back. If you want to pull up on uh, the East Grade Road above Lake Henshaw, Again, legal flying. There's a lovely little place here. Uh, it's a raptor view, so you can um, understand a little bit about the hydrology of the area and things like that. And um, I, I just like going here. It's our favorite place to eat lunch on our way there. Gives you some nice views. You notice I shot these in, in March, so plenty of yellow wildflowers. And that's what it looks like from a distance overlooking Lake Henshaw. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. Desi, you want to take it away? Unmute myself here. So while I jump back into the presentation, um, Jim, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more about if somebody was going to be flying at the AMA field? Um, I are they allowed to just show up or talk about maybe the membership, how that works? I know some are a little bit more welcoming, but you still need to be a member. So if maybe you can share a little bit about that. Yep, absolutely. And you, you, you make a great point. Clubs are entitled to do with their facility what they can. And several, several clubs, Choyas Park is a good example. At Choyas Park, you come up and it's a locked gate. You're not getting through the gate unless you have been invited and someone's giving you the combination. Uh, Chula Vista is, you can see from the roadway, so you can drive down. Uh, same with silent electric flyers. The gate's open and it says visitors welcome. Now, visitors are one thing, flyers are something else. So if you do not have AMA and you like a facility, you're going to have to be sponsored by someone to sign their little guest law book, uh, log book, or... If you're there with someone like myself, uh, who's a designated IP instructor for the AMA, IP instructors, you can fly with them and you're covered under their insurance. So as a guest, you need someone to sponsor you and say you can fly there. Um, most clubs at the AMA will give you three visits before they say, if you like the place, come on and join and participate and help it stay. Um, but, uh, the best part about being an AMA member is that once you've got that AMA card, now you can go 
any AMA site coast to coast. You go on vacation, find an AMA field, go fly. Um, because it's so easy to travel with your drone. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the greatest benefits of the AMA. Great. Good to know. Good to know. Oh, oh. there's Eric showing off his card. <laughs> He's a member. Hey, wait, wait. Is, am, I, am I being called out here? <laughs> Yeah, oh gosh! It's, no, it's too dirty. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna even let you focus on this. <laughs> I had to move my back and forth so that the screen would pick it up. I couldn't even yeah. see mine. <laughs> so hopefully, I'll be sharing my screen here. Am I sharing? Can you see the screen? I should be coming back to my. We screen. see it loud we and clear. See, see all see of it. We see all of it. We don't see all presentation it. view. Okay. Well. Go to presentation view. All right. I'm working on it. <laughs> there you go. Or play your play your show. There you, you go. Got there. It. You got it. So now you know what's coming up. So, yes. but we're almost done. I know we have gone over a little bit. We do have a couple more questions that are popping up right now, and. Um, I want to bump ahead. So um, coming up, I want to uh, let you know that coming up next month is Jim. He will be talking a lot more. Uh, we got it all scheduled. So July 14th, he'll be uh, coming in here and doing a webinar for us as well. And then I also want to make sure that you reach out to us because we want to provide the information that you want to hear. So to help us plan what we should be talking about, what you want to hear, please reach out to us and let us know. Give us your comments, your feedback. We want to know from you, okay? With that, we are going to open it up. Wait, I hear, I see. Daisy, can I jump in for a second? <laughs> I need your attention for a minute if I can have another two I can minutes. see. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, cool. All right. So, you know, in next, next month, one of the things I talk about is being efficient with your time, equipment, and things like that, being a professional. And you know that I'm a really big fan of the Hoodie Vision shade, right? This, this is really important to me. It really becomes super important. Well, I was up at Hoodie Vision and talking with my good friend, Steve, and I know something that, I know something about you, and we custom made you a couple, <laughs> a couple of pink, a couple of pink hoodie vis. So we got one for an iPad full size, and we got one for our <laughs> mini. Whoa, and yeah, nice. These are, <laughs> these are one of a kind, one off, just for you, girl. No All way. Right? I feel hey, honored. Listen, oh we, my God. We yes, love what I'm you're all doing. about pink. I am all about pink. <laughs> we love what you're doing. And this is just a super thank, thank you. you from uh, myself, from my friends at High Tech Commercial Services, and from Steve at Hoodie Vision. You know, we're, we're going to keep doing this, but this is just a little fun thank you that's exclusive for you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm All right. honored. Wow. <laughs> yes, pink is my color. <laughs> yes. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> So, all right. Well, we do have a couple questions that I would like to get to here. Um, they asked if the list of uh, locations will be available. Um, typically, I've been able to post a private link for this. So I'm going to assume I'll be able to do a private link. So you'll be able to do a replay for it. Um, are there any updates on receiving waivers? So we might need to be a little bit more specific on that as far as if you can post in there, is there a specific waiver that you're talking about? Because the FAA has actually gotten pretty quick. I've been impressed with how quick uh, Two weeks. they're Two getting weeks. back. Yeah, wow. very, very impressed with um, once you go through the process, they're just really fast on it now. Uh, got another question here about website for joining the AMA. Yes, we can provide that into the chat. Um, Wyatt or possible Jim. Jim's on it. All right, that would be great. Yeah, we could post that in Done. there. It's in there. Done. Look at him. He's fast. 
So great information here. Please, if you come up with a question or have anything else that you wanted to talk about, feel free to reach out to us. We are all available. We try to be available through email, phone calls, conversations. We're out there. We're actually out there a lot. So feel free to reach out to us, all right? All right, if we don't have any last minute questions, um, I think I've addressed them all that are, oh, uh, about flying over people, is that based on altitude? No, the FAA says that you are not allowed to fly over people. Um, it, it is waverable, but you would have to go through the FAA uh, website and state all your facts of why you would be safe and how you're going to conduct this operation in a safe manner and they will give it to you based on your whether you're safe or not so that is something you would do but otherwise no they, they you would want to do what they call Kona safety and you want to make sure that you're not flying over people and uh, wings credit okay so I have been told that um, I will look into it because I was told that by doing the webinar kind of side that there may not be an option for wings credit but I will look into that again for you okay mark all right uh, any other questions yeah, I want to go camping with Eric out at the dinosaurs. Oh my God, so do I. I we, we, so... we, could do, we could do a fun trip out there. Uh, yeah, no, I'm more than up for hosting a uh, show you around Borrego and the Salton Sea trip anytime. I'm getting, to, <laughs> I'm getting my deep into overlanding, so I'm, I'm ready to camp. <laughs> do I you am. see the last, the last minute? <laughs> Somebody wants to join the nudist club. <laughs> okay, so oh, it's yay. so fun you share okay. that because I've got a video. I've got a video that yeah. shows that I, I flew a commercial video, the music video at that place. Okay, and the okay. first flight. This is yeah. hilarious. The yeah. first yeah. flight, yeah. I went out and back. I went out and back, and sure enough, there's this guy walking down the tracks. Yeah, <laughs> naked as a jaybird. Hilarious. It doesn't mean everybody go fly there because of this. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, if, if everybody gave him twenty bucks, they'd be happier. They no problem. Okay. Isn't the I, direction I'm saying? No. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. I will remember that trick. That's a good one. All right. One. Well, I I think we've covered everything. Uh, please, <laughs> yeah. like I said, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us. And oh, we have another one. Any best way to get a Part 107 uh, review website? Yes, I got a great one. I got a great one. Go to Droners.io. Droners.io has a free 107 study guide. Bing, bing, bing. Uh, yeah. Could, could I make a suggestion on 107 too? Um, when you go in to take it, make sure the area is either well lit or you bring your own light. I took mine up here at, at Palomar and I went in, I missed seven questions and I swear five of them because I couldn't read the sectional charts. My eyes are not all that great and I'm sitting there squinting up at the charts I couldn't read them with squat, you know, and, and the area was kind of dimly lit. So I'd, I'd bring your own reading light. <laughs> I always say bring a magnifier. <laughs> yeah. A magnifying glass is legal to bring in. Yes, a light is. or a flashlight is not. Okay. I, I, I demand to be put in a place with better lighting. I, even, I, I mean, even with the magnifying glass, I wish I'd had one. I don't know if I would have been able to, 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 to read that because it was it was really kind of dark well that's surprising so but i know you can bring in the magnifying glass okay so and the i know the charts are very small <laughs> well this, this chart had been like rubbed back and forth about probably ten thousand times so yeah you know, it, it was all gray and smudged and looked like it was from world war ii or something <laughs> So, all right. Well, I know we went over in time. Uh, hope you still got a lot of value out of it. Looking forward to how we can make money with our drone next month. So keep an eye on the uh, announcements that will come out for that. And thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye safe. Bye. All right. I'm cutting. Okay.